presentation. Our next speaker will be Dr. Mohamed Omar Al-Farouh. He'll be talking about artificial intelligence and aortic disease. Uh, Rahim. I would like to thank Dr. Hadia very much for the kind invitation and uh, with her enthusiasm to, toward building uh, such a vascular unit. And I'm sure this will be uh, one of the best units that we are privileged to have in Egypt. And uh, hopefully the Congress will be one of the biggest Congress. I would like to share with you uh, a topic which is a little bit recent, which is artificial intelligence in vascular surgery, especially in aortic disease. Uh, my content, I will discuss what is really AI um, and some example and then how we can use it for aortic disease. Well, artificial intelligence, whenever you have any machine that is developing a way of thinking like the ChatGPT3, ChatGPT4, like multiple facilities that we are using which imitate humans. So they are not humans and they are by machine, and this depends on the machine learning. We can see this in, uh, for example, car, electric car with auto drive. We all have it in our mobile, prediction of your next word. All of this is the basis of artificial intelligence. So we must know artificial intelligence, which is a big category, which involve machine learning, which is a little bit more dedicated, and we have what is called deep learning and deep learning means network and network is exactly like the human brain how it works and uh, basically this all can be done online you don't need to buy a computer you just need to know a little bit about programming language called python and with python machine learning is very very easy and i will show you um, what i have done with these uh, level, multiple level of machine learning. How can this help me as vascular surgeon treating aorta? Well, it's a good computer knowledge, but uh, if you have a clinical problem and then you start to have a vision of a task to be done by the computer and you enjoy the privilege of a huge data, big data, and then you can do what is called data proce processing and data mingling and then you can develop a program to solve your problem. This is the basic idea. Um, so I've divided the AI in Aorta into three steps. You can use AI tools pre-operative or intra-operative or post-operative. Let us take some example. Before you have the patient, can we predict the cross of aortic aneurysm? Can we predict post-operative mortality? of open repair? Can we predict rupture of aortic aneurysm? All this is clinical problems. And the automatic measurement um, of aortic aneurysm. So let us take the first one. Machine learning have developed a, a, a program that can predict the gross of aortic aneurysm. And you will see here in this gram, this is the actual growth compared to uh, I'm sorry about this voice. Um, so this is the actual growth compared to the predicted growth. So this program can predict the growth of aortic aneurysm to the nearest two millimeter. And this is already found in, um, in vascular units. So we can predict there is already this machine is, uh, this uh, program is, is present. We can predict also hospital mortality after rupture. This is very nice uh, module which a vascular surgeon have got four risk factor. If you are above 80, if you came with severe hypotension, other risk factor. And with this, he made a machine learning program. Uh, we call it artificial network. And this artificial network depends on these four parameters that he took. And he have a prediction of output, which will predict mortality. And again, they found that this program using um, this uh, software can predict how much mortality. So you can know the patient on arrival, if you have 95% mortality, then you need to really go very caution. Nothing have reached 100% accuracy, but this definitely give you a light about the case you're managing. Now, this is a beautiful case because here the program can predict rupture. 
we, they have found that if you find the amount of thrombus into the aorta and you do modeling, aorting modeling to the thrombus, it will tell you if this aneurysm is going to rupture. This is a patient you can see in 2017 to 2019, the aneurysm have not changed its size. It is 5.5. But the thrombus has increased. If you do, this was 50, actually less than 5.5. It was 51 millimeter. So if you do automatic analysis with artificial intelligence to the thrombus, it will predict where the thrombus is going to rupture. And this actually what happened to this patient. This patient have ruptured the red dot is the area where you have the maximum diameter of a thrombus. And six months later, he actually ruptured at exact the point that was predicted by artificial intelligence. So it can definitely help you pre-operative. What about intraoperative? Now there is a sophisticated software called CIDR, which has been adopted by Philips and Siemens. And this software can predict into leak type 2 while you are working. Because it read every pixel in the X-ray. And whenever you have an into leak type 2, it will give you a special color to the into leak type 2 that you cannot see with your own eyes. Because uh, imaging analysis and imaging acquisition with artificial intelligence, they don't forget any pixel. They see every pixel, and you must know that our um, resolution, we have 1,200 pixel per cubic millimeter. So the machine learning can see what we clinician cannot see. And this is important, artificial intelligence. Now, post-operative, if you put a patient to criteria to chat GPT-3, it will give you the best post-operative follow up to this patient. This is actually happening now with your mobile. If you just uh, install GPT-3 or BART or any of the artificial program and you put the uh, CT scan of the patient, you put the patient history examination and you tell him uh, uh, suggest the post-operative follow up for this patient. Uh, he will give you the best follow up, how much duplex scan and when do you need to do the CT scan. So you can imagine this tool is very beneficial. The reason of this lecture was actually, I've been invited to give an AI program to one of the universities in the United States to first year medical student. So first year medical student in the United States, one of their things that they are learning is AI, artificial intelligence. And believe me, they are such a very um, enthusiastic group of medical students because you don't need a Pi computer. You can use Google Colab. And you don't need a big software. It's all supplied free of charge. And you can do all this over what is called the cloud computing. You don't have just a CPU, but you have GPU, which is gigabyte processing unit. And you have a TPU, which is terabyte processing unit. All of this is free of charge. So I have made a free uh, AI program to vascular surgeon that is free to anyone to join. If you just to go artificial intelligence to vascular surgeon Egypt on Google, uh, you will be directed toward this AI program. And um, I have uh, modified two programs, one which detect the COVID-19 in chest X-ray using machine learning, and another one which can detect the pneumonia on a chest X-ray machine learning. We are working at the moment on using Python 3 with the uh, what is called Pandas library, which have a lot of machine learning software to develop uh, aortic uh, prediction uh, of uh, the aortic growth of aortic aneurysm. So uh, my conclusion, artificial intelligence will definitely play a major role to us as vascular surgeon. You must use AI tools by today because it is freely available on Microsoft. It is freely available called BARD. On, um, on, on Google, they also have their AI tools, um, and they are very, very, they can diagnose a lot of clinical situation. They can read CT scan, they can read duplex scan as well, and they can give you a diagnosis. The, uh, the ability that AI have is really huge. So I'm sure it will play a major role in vascular surgery field. Uh, we can deal with a lot of big data, it can analyze a lot of big data and give you a very good information. 
and it will definitely improve our clinician and improve our vascular surgeries. And thank you very much. Um, so the last presentation has been cancelled, and we have we have five minutes for discussions. Um, if anybody has a question for Professor Hussam Rojdi for his presentation, I will go to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed your talk very much, and uh, it was very nice paper in collaboration with Italy and other centers. It was very respectable number, which is 500. Uh, my question, how much cases has been done in Egypt and how much cases has been done abroad? And definitely, I, I really uh, encourage your work to work in collaboration uh, with them. So if, if we are maybe 5%, I would be very happy. Uh, about uh, 100 cases uh, uh, that in Egypt and the other in Italy. Cairo University and Mansour University. Dr. Mohammed Hosni can be with us in Uh, thank you. And uh, a question for Professor Tamir uh, Khafagi. Uh, if you may, uh, allow me, I want to ask you, um, I, did, I didn't uh, catch that. Did you put an IVC filter before the surgery? Uh, no, we no, don't, and, and don't use an IVC filter okay. uh, during surgery. Do you think uh, because it has been uh, a, it actually, uh, a benefit? Actually, during the surgery, all the thrombus was licensed. So the only uh, present inside the IVC was the mass which is lobulated, as you see in the MRI pictures before the surgery, and there is no thrombus during the uh, surgery. Another question? Dr. Tamer, uh, thank you for this nice case. Uh, you didn't know the nature of the tumor beforehand, before you go into surgery, right? Yes. You didn't have a, a tissue uh, diagnosis? No, no. So if we, uh, we have been confronted with a malignant tumor of the IVC, what would you do? Uh, I mean, this tumor was easily uh, separable from the wall of the IVC. If you needed to resect a segment of the IVC, and this area was near the renal veins, what would have you done? This, this was uh, our fear before this surgery. So we do multiple investigation, all the ultrasound and the MRI, which diagnose that this is a tumor, um, say that this is benign tumor. And also we do a review for the literature we see a small number of cases. Uh, most of them was uh, benign, and there is no uh, apparent uh, solution for us to know actually if it is malignant or not. So we go for uh, the surgery, and then we do uh, the pathology. Also during the surgery, uh, the mass looks like benign. So we was uh, not fear to do uh, excision. Can you elaborate more on the post-operative anticoagulation for this patient? Yes, we give them the usual anticoagulation as uh, any case of deep vein thrombosis. We do. We give them the full anticoagulation, especially this patient presented with thrombosis from the start. So we give her uh, anticoagulation for uh, six months. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tamir, for a very interesting case. Um, I, I'm sure you have a multidisciplinary decision-making process with this case. Yes. My question is. Did you consult with the radiologist if he can give you a tissue biopsy before you start using Shigora needle, which is very easily CT guided or MRI guided because you have indulged over a major surgery without really reaching diagnosis. I will say this because if I got the diagnosis, which is a benign endothelioma, which is very common, uh, uh, why you didn't put a covered stent on IVC to avoid such a major surgery and you can actually cure the problem. So okay. my question is, you indulge it into major surgery before finalizing the diagnostic tools and diagnostic dilemma. Uh, when we do a review of the literature for these cases, uh, we uh, find that uh, it, there is no large number of cases. Uh, the most uh, one, three cases this on maximum. Uh, but we find that uh, most of them do stenting at first, and then these stents come with fracture. So uh, they go for surgery. So that's why we don't uh, try to uh, repeat 
their uh, bad experience. We go for surgery from the start because about 90% uh, of the lumen occluded by the, the mass. So if we put a stent, it may end by fracture as most of the cases in the literature. So we go for surgery from the start because of this. Another comment. Uh, if we have uh, the tumor was actually totally located uh, below the, uh, the renal veins, we have a distance to do resection and to it put was, a three centimeter graft. It was about the graft, renal veins. And it was actually it was between the hepatic veins and, and the renal, the renal veins. veins. Above the renal veins. We, we was preparing the graft for in such situation if we have to put a graft and during the resection, you can do your, your main aim in creating benign is not to put it out. Your main aim is to make it not affecting the IVC flow. As my doctor uh, or my colleague <laughs> says that in, in the published literature showed that this uh, tumor actually it grows rapidly. It can cause fracture. All, all the cases in the literature end by, fracture end by stent fracture. All the cases. So we don't try to... Uh, how, how, I'm just interesting. How many cases has been done with this? Three cases. Three, three cases in And the three cases they have put the stent. Most of the cases are uh, was case reports. Only okay. one case or so. so the so largest you know, number was three cases. Yeah. So three cases worldwide experience. No, no. The, the largest series was three cases. But there is multiple uh, single okay. cases uh, okay. worldwide. I don't uh, Do you know which stent has fractured? Because now we have a stent that will never fracture. The type I, 2 and 3 I generation. Think by the tumor, the tumor will fracture anything. And okay. this uh, was their experience. I don't want to try it. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much. Now, any question for Professor uh, Omar Farouk? I have a question, sir. <laughs> How did you see the future of uh, vascular surgery in uh, in the presence of this artificial intelligence? Are we <laughs> are going to lose most of our jobs or not? That's a good question. Um, this is what we call courtes courtesy question. Whenever you don't have a question to the actual speaker, so the panelists will say, well, I will have a kind of question to him. So thank you very much for your kind of question. Secondly, well, uh, chat GPT will, um, will fire 80% of jobs in the United States in five years. None of them is vascular surgery. So we're not going to be fired. And I think if we are clever enough, we can ride on the tool of AI. I'm sure, I'm quite sure, within a couple of years, things will change dramatically. It's already been changed. Now, if you have a, a CT scan in Dubai, it will be reported by AI. And now, AI can diagnose cancer breast more accurate than expert physician. So, if you get an expert physician, tell you cancer, they'll tell you, I'm sorry, I will just upload the software and then see if this report is right or wrong. Is it going to affect us? In a big way, in a big way, I'm not, I'm not sure you know that ChatGPT have passed USMLE with 98% success. So now you have the biggest human brain in the world that you can speak to. You can tell him, I have this patient, I have this problem. It will, no question about it, will affect our future. Thanks a lot. We are shifting now to the second session. Okay. You have a question? Uh, yes, please. I'm Ahmed Baid, I'm in the German Army in the year 5th, in vascular surgery. If the human being is not able to take the world, but what is the special concern and what is the concern that there is a medical and medical and all the countries will be able to take this idea uh, thank you very much. Germany is really one of the uh, unique educational systems that is uh, adopting a lot of AI. Uh, regarding privacy, the, uh, they are now uh, putting what is called prompt inside the chat GPT. This prompt will prevent patient name or face or eyes to come in the reply of a chat GPT. So here, Confidentiality is already been sorted out. You could never reveal patient confidentiality 
even if you enter the data of the patient with his image, it will be canceled. Secondly, the big data. Now, all the United States um, CT scan, ultrasound, and so on, is being put into a big data library that we all, as a programmer, can access in, in, in what is called testing our program. So if I got a software that will predict aortic aneurysm, I can go to, for example, Pennsylvania University to all their aortic cases and do testing module on their cases and get my results. So one of the beauty about AI that all the courses and the data are freely available. At the moment, there is no regulation who has owned what. But we are all working with it. It is rapidly developing. There is actually a group on Twitter, which is in AI, aortic disease, dimension development. So you can see how specific things are. So using AI does not reveal confidentiality of the patient. This has been out. Secondly, information are freely available. Thirdly, it will affect our future in a big way. Because now the patient will come to you in Germany, in Leipzig, he will go to chat GBT, tell him, this is my case. I'm going to see physician tomorrow. Can you give me the question I need to ask him? So if you don't deal as vascular surgeon with this technology, will be kicked out very easily. But it is very helpful technology. I know a lot of people are afraid of using AI. I use it in my mobile every day, probably 30 times. And I advise everyone to use it at least once per day. Otherwise, you will be outside the AI environment. And thank you very much. It's a very good question. Yes, we are shifting to the second session. Okay, we call the chairman of the second session, uh, Dr. Adel Husseini, Dr. Hussein Kamal, uh, Professor uh, uh, Khalid Mouafi, uh, Professor Tamir Khafagi, Professor Samir Rigal. Uh, so the moderator for the next session, please come in, Tamir.